proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. And please do so. Your Honor, I'm, I'm now going to talk about sniping. Sniping played a different role in the campaign of terror against Sarajevans. The noisy imprecision of the modified air bombs was in contrast to the lethal silence of the sniper's bullet. Sarajevans would hide behind buildings and shipping containers, gathering the courage to dash across a street where others had been felled before. In silent perches around the city, VRS soldiers waited in vantage points above the tram line. Above paths, civilians had to travel to get food, water, fuel for heat. Waiting silently, finger poised on the trigger until someone dared to rush in front of the crosshairs of a scope. The main street running along the Miljetska River became so famous for the number of shootings that it was called Sniper's Alley. One of these snipers will appear before you and provide evidence of this aspect of the campaign of terror. He will describe his orders to shoot at anything that moved down below his perch. Other witnesses will provide evidence of how snipers were trained and how the activity of snipers around the city was coordinated. Today, Nurman Divovich would be 25. Back on the 18th of November, 1994, he was seven. Growing up in a Sarajevo under siege. Nurman was returning with his mother and sister from collecting firewood. As they crossed the street on their way home, a sniper aligned his rifle towards Nerman's mother. His bullet passed through her abdomen and struck Nerman, who had been walking beside her. The sniper's bullet struck his head, causing a catastrophic and mortal injury. The little boy dropped dead onto the pavement below his mother's feet. She thought he was simply doing what she had taught him to do. Lie down when you hear gunfire. Quote, I was at the first crossing. My girl crossed. Ran across and I stayed behind with Nerman. And I just saw that my boy fell down. And because I would always tell him, son, when they're shooting, lie down. And I didn't realize that he was wounded until unperfor put him behind the bushes. At that moment, I wasn't aware my little boy was killed. Slide 83 is a picture from a sniper's nest. Over the course of the case, the prosecution will tender photos from a number of sniper's nests. What these and other pictures will make clear is that sniping in Sarajevo was often from close distances, sometimes a matter of a few hundred meters. Mladic's use of snipers in the context of the attack on the civilian population was not at all like the use of snipers in armed conflict. It was a strategy of shooting civilians from a hiding spot, giving them no warning or reasonable prospect of taking cover. It was about creating insecurity, about creating terror. Here is a photo from another sniper's nest. The photographer did not use any magnification in taking the picture and took the photo to depict the edges of the hole where the barrel went through. You can get some sense of the scale and the proximity of the tram there just below the sniper's nest. The prosecution will also tender documentary evidence regarding sniping. 
Here in slide 85, an intelligence officer from the Sarajevo Romania Corps of the VRS states, quote, Sniping is to be stopped only by orders and the inner organization and accordingly by taking of adequate measures, unquote. It specifically notes that the final decision on any measures related to sniping would be taken by the second by the Corps commander. John Jordan was a volunteer fireman for the US who traveled to Sarajevo to help fellow firefighters after seeing them being sniped as they tried to put out fires to assist people who had been injured. He made the following observations. Quote, What excuse can there be for shooting a firefighter while he's trying to put out a residential fire? What reason can there be for shelling water lines, bread lines, places with no military purpose? I can't remember a time when we weren't picking up wounded and dead people. The thing I noticed about certain attacks was that Serb shooters would often go after the youngest in the family. In a crowd of girls, it seemed that the most attractive would be shot. It seemed that there was something very personal, almost grudge attacks, doing whatever would cause the most pain to the survivors. <coughs> Unquote. On the 15th of August, 1994, Ratko Mladic spent part of the day driving Milan Lesage, a supporter from Canada, around eastern Bosnia. Lesage's video recorded some of their travels and his conversation with Mladic. They are driving down a road that reminded Mladic that his men had once cleared that road of barricades using chainsaws and tanks. Mladic turns the conversation to Sarajevo and how sniper fire disrupted the traffic there. Slide 87 is a still from that video showing Mladic as he drives the car. He says, quote, And whenever I come by Sarajevo, I kill someone in passing. That's why the traffic for Sarajevo was disrupted. Snipers. I go kick the hell out of the Turks. This statement was captured on the video recording. The camera is pointing out of the car or at his dashboard, but it is what Mr. Mladic says that we are most interested in. I will ask Ms. Stewart to play the video now. Now I will drive you as if you were a director. On this road, on this road, but I fucked them. I let them there, made a mask, and then we cleaned up the barricades here with chainsaws. This all had been blocked. And then we brought tanks here and kicked the hell out of the Turks. Kicked the hell out of them. And whenever I come by Sarajevo, I kill someone in passing. That's why the traffic for Sarajevo was disrupted. I go kick the hell out of the Turks. Who, who gives a fuck for them? Somehow I and my have to, I don't know whether you kill that kind over there in Canada and America, you ought to kill these Ustashes there and those who support them and ours as well as those who collaborate with them. Yes, those should be first. Mladic talks about personally sniping the people of Sarajevo as if it were a sport, a form of recreation. For the many injured, killed, for the thousands who crossed the street each day, sent their children to school not knowing that the day would end in tragedy, it was not recreation. The combined effect of indiscriminate shelling and the sniping of civilians was a persistent fog of terror 
that permeated the lives of all who lived through it. During the siege between April 1992 until November 1995, those who lived in Sarajevo lived with the ever-present reality that serious injury or death awaited them each minute. Each time they stepped out from a building, each time they put their children to bed. Walking wasn't safe, driving wasn't safe, the tram wasn't safe, your home wasn't safe. This terror designed by Karadzic and Miladzic and visited upon Sarajevo was the grim reality for Sarajevans during the siege. The first strategic objective, ethnic separation. The first and most important strategic objective was its demographic one, ethnic separation, ensuring that the lands controlled by Bosnian Serbs were devoid of Muslims and Croats. Slide 90 is a document from the first Kryena Corps, less than 10 days after the formation of the VRS. Quote, Serbian people must struggle for complete separation from the Muslim and Croatian peoples and form their own state, unquote. The Bosnian Serb Army main staff coordinated the removal of people ethnically cleansed from their homes. Slide 91 shows a report from the Drina Corps to the VRS main staff. On the 31st of January, 1993, here the Zvornik Brigade opened a corridor for 10 hours so that those ethnically cleansed from their homes in eastern Bosnia could leave the area. Slide 92 is a UN report from October of 1992. It demonstrates that the clear pattern of killing, rape, and destruction of homes made clear that ethnic cleansing was the purpose of military action and not the unintended consequence. Quote, ethnic cleansing does not appear to be the consequence of the war, but rather its goal. This goal, to a large extent, has already been achieved through killings, beatings, rape, destruction of houses and threats. Hundreds of thousands of people being forced to leave their homes and to abandon their belongings in order to save their lives, unquote. Here in slide 93, Miladic is told that people were being evicted. There can be no question of people fleeing war. This is the forcible removal of people from their homes. Miladic notes, quote, we were most active in evicting the Muslims we had brought peace to Shepak, Divic, and Kozluk. Some of them wanted to move out, and we also demanded it, unquote. Kozluk was a town north of Zvornik. The Muslim population had turned over all weapons and agreed to recognize the new Serb authorities. This entry is a reference to the day buses arrived and every single person in Kozlik was made board the bus. They were transported through Serbia to the Hungarian border. Earlier I showed you an entry from Miladic's notebook regarding the progress of ethnic cleansing in Bratunac. Here on slide 94 is another entry regarding Bratunac in which Miladic notes that there are no Muslims in Bratunac. The town is considered fully liberated. 
Another way Bosnian Serb leaders sought to make ethnic cleansing permanent was the destruction of religious and cultural property. In some cases, churches and mosques were destroyed, and in some cases the land was paved for parking lots or other buildings were erected on the site. The prosecution will limit its evidence regarding the destruction of religious and cultural property to the destruction in 11 municipalities. But even from this limited presentation, the chamber will be able to conclude that such destruction was part of a campaign of persecution. One of the most important tools for ethnic cleansing was the coordinated system of gathering non-Serbs, concentrating them in detention centers, and ultimately ejecting them from Bosnian Serb-held territory. Bosnian Serb leaders established a system of ejecting non-Serbs under the misnomer of exchanges. From the outset, this system was created to include the detention and forcible removal of civilians from targeted territory. On the 8th of May, 1992, a Central Commission for the Exchange of Prisoners was established and immediately began the process of organizing the collection of prisoners, both military and civilian, and in, and in ensuring, at least in the case of civilian detainees, that they were removed to areas that were not targeted by Serbs. Slide 95 shows a document from the Bosnian Serb police dated the 2nd of July, 1992. The document makes clear two things. First, that in the overall enterprise, the Bosnian Serb army is to play a prominent role in the capture of as many Muslim civilians as possible. And second, that the detention camps these people are to be placed in, camps, these camps do not observe international norms. Quote, the army, crisis staffs, and war presidencies have requested that the army round up or capture as many Muslim civilians as possible. And they leave such undefined camps to internal affairs organs. The conditions in some of these camps are poor. There is no food. Individuals sometimes do not observe international norms, etc. Unquote. Bosnian Serb leaders created a coordinated system through which non-Serbs could be gathered, counted them, prevented them from resettling in Serb conquered areas, and either killed them or permanently ejected them. Slide 96 illustrates the role these detention facilities played in ethnic cleansing. This slide refers to the detention facility known as Kula. It is described in Indictment Schedule C8.1. Here, a member of the Sarajevo Romania Corps on the 17th of June, 1992, is expressing concern that the camp is being used to separate civilians according to their ethnicity. You will see that such cautions were ignored. And the crimes in Kula went on for about two and a half years after this report was filed. Each municipality had its own local system for detaining non-Serbs. Impromptu detention centers were set up in police stations, local schools, factories, garages as needed. Places like Karaman's house in Foča or the elementary school in Kalinovic. Here detainees were brutalized, tortured, and many detainees were killed. Soon larger facilities were established. These facilities served as regional detention facilities 
and received prisoners from municipal authorities. Facilities such as Batkovits, Kula. The most notorious of these camps, Omarska and Karaturm in Priador, were run by Republic of Srpska police officers with VRS personnel providing security around the perimeter. The VRS also directly established some camps. Minyacha camp in Banja Luka, Batkovic camp near Bialina were both established by the VRS. Susicha camp in Vlasnica was established by an order signed by a mayor, Andrich. Here on slide 97, we can see the actual order by Miladic relating to the establishment of Manyacha camp. You will hear from Osman Selik, a former colonel in the Yugoslav army, who was present on the 1st of June, 1992, when Colonel Momir Talic issued the order to establish Manyacha. Talic's order to establish Manyacha on the 1st of June was formalized by this order issued on the 12th of June. I will pause for a moment to allow you to read it. Dr. Enes Sabanovic will describe the routine physical abuse and inhumane conditions at Manyacha. As a doctor detained in the camp, he was forced to falsify death certificates, covering up the murders of inmates. Your Honors, I'm going to ask Ms. Stewart to play a video from a news report on Manyacha camp. Although the reporter speaks English, the sound has deteriorated over the years. We have added English subtitles to assist you in understanding what the reporter is saying. Now home to more than 600 men. Here the prisoners live, eat, and sleep 24 hours a day. Most of these men just arrived two days ago from the camp of the master. Their faces still haunted by memories they did not dare relate in the presence of their guards. Conditions here, they told them, things were much better than the place they'd just come from. Our leadership is under tremendous pressure to allow outsiders access to these camps. The proposed UN resolution would authorize any means necessary to implement that access, as well as guarantee the supply of humanitarian aid. The prisoners we are to maintain they are civilians, not soldiers. Those we saw are crammed into cattle sheds where they spend all day and all night huddled together like... There can be no doubt that Miladic and his subordinates who ran some of these camps or participated in the operations of others were fully aware of what was taking place there. In this report on slide 99, we can see that the officials in Manyacha fully appreciated the illegality of these facilities and the role they played in ethnic cleansing. Quote, this camp can be considered as a detention camp. That is, a camp for the segregation of Muslims and Croats, which history will not forgive us. Unquote. In fact, in many cases, detaining these prisoners served a dual process for the Bosnian Serb leaders. In addition to facilitating the ethnic cleansing, these detention camps, in some instances, gathered people to be used as hostages. As Juplinen noted in slide 100, quote, The third category is composed of adult men about whom the service does not have any information of security interest for us so far. 
Therefore, they can be used as hostages, unquote. All of these camps were part of a system for the detention and mistreatment of non-Serbs targeted in the ethnic cleansing campaign. The camps were integral to the overall project of taking land from non-Serbs who lived there. These detention camps were places of great suffering. Food was insufficient Sanitation was often rudimentary and inadequate, insufficient for the large number of prisoners. Detainees were often the subject of regular beatings, torture, rape, and other crimes of sexual violence and murder. The conditions were inhumane. They would have been insufficient to sustain farm animals, let alone humans. In addition to the inhumane conditions, prisoners were regularly beaten, sometimes so extreme as to result in death. I would now like to play a video depicting men detained at Ternopoli. There is some inaudible speech in the video. There is no translation, and the prosecution is relying only on the images and not on what the prisoners are saying. In one night alone in July 1992, at the Caraturm camp in Priador, approximately 150 men were murdered. That same month, about 150 men were killed in Amarska. Approximately 140 Susicha prisoners were killed on a single occasion in September 1992. Survivors of these camps will describe conditions in those camps that are simply beyond the realm of our experience. An excerpt of the evidence of RM008 is now on the screen in slide 102. He was a witness to the massacre of 150 men in Karaturm in what is referred to as the Room 3 Massacre. Quote, Question, Do you know how many people were eventually detained in Room Number 3 at Karaturm? Answer, Once when they were counted, it was 570. People were packed like sardines. And there was perspiration. There was condensation on the walls. So it was very hot. And people licked those walls to get something because there was no water. Unquote. None of us can imagine conditions so harsh. None of us can imagine a thirst so vicious that it would drive someone to lick condensed sweat off a wall. I would like to conclude my remarks on the detention camps by showing you a map of the major camps in the indictment. Slide 103 indicates the location of the major detention centers in which the people taken prisoner in the municipalities and first kept at smaller detention sites were sent. As you can see in the area of the second strategic objective, there are Omarska, Karaturm, Ternopoli, and Manyatsa. 
In the area of the third strategic objective, there are Barkovitz, Lasenitsa, Razadnik, and KP Dome. Kula was outside of Sarajevo. This was an integrated system of detention and mistreatment specifically designed to help realize the strategic objectives. Consider the case of RM041, who had the misfortune of being held in six different facilities. His path has been traced on slide 103. He began in the local Velko Vlahovic School Detention Center in Rogatica and then was transferred to Razadnik, then to the police station in Zvornik, on to Batkovic, back to Razadnik, and finally on to Kula, from which he was ultimately released. Other witnesses will describe their journey through the camp system, moving through several of the large camps in the Kraina and ultimately escaping or being released alive if they were fortunate. The prisoners in these camps were used as a source of forced labor, in some cases being forced to engage in work in dangerous battle zones. Some of the transfers between camps was done to meet labor needs. During the trial, the prosecution will tender military documents setting out in greater detail this system. The hostage crisis. The last component of the prosecution case arises from the hostage crisis in 1995, an incident in which UN peacekeepers were taken hostage by members of the VRS. On the 31st of August, 1994, the German weekly Der Spiegel published an interview with Radovan Karadzic. You can see an excerpt from it on slide 104. I'm sorry, 105 if we could advance to that slide. In that interview, he was explicit about his intention to order the taking of hostages, and in particular, UN personnel, referred to in the article as Blue Helmets. Karadzic, acting together with Milotic, went through with this threat, and it is the subject of count 11 of the indictment, the war crime of taking hostages. I would like to return to Sarajevo in order to prov provide you some background on the hostage crisis. That period between the 26th of May and the 19th of June, 1995, when Milotic's forces took over 200 UN peacekeepers hostage. The 16th of May, 1995, the VRS commenced some of its heaviest shelling of Sarajevo, certainly since 1993. In May, 1995, there were seven teams of UN military observers stationed across the city. Their job was to monitor military activity. This entailed, in part, counting the shells fired into Sarajevo. On this day, 17 years ago, in response to a Bosnian army mortar attack on the VRS Lukavica barracks, over 1,500 detonations were recorded in Sarajevo. Over 1,500 shells sent into the city by the Bosnian Serb Army. The 24th of May, General Rupert Smith, the unperformed commander, gave Karadzic and Miladic an ultimatum to cease the heavy weapons bombardment. They refused to comply, and in response, NATO planes attacked to Bosnian Serb ammunition depots. The VRS responded by preventing some UN military observers from leaving their posts and by removing others 
and detaining them at different locations. The VRS abducted 33 more unperformed personnel from observation posts around Garajde. In Sarajevo, dozens of unperformed members were taken hostage between the 26th and 27th of May. Here on slide 106, a peacekeeper describes the matter-of-fact way in which he was taken hostage. Quote, The officer, in a very decisive tone, said from, that from then on, he was in charge. That we, he said exactly that, from that very moment, we were being taken hostage by the army. Unquote. The VRS also used UN hostages and their uniforms to raid and take control of additional UN observation posts and to capture additional hostages. By the end of May, over 200 UN personnel were in the VRS custody, with at least 17 of them being used as human shields to protect VRS installations from further airstrikes. One such UNMO was filmed by local television tied to a radar station. When he was brought to the site, he overheard some of his captors say that Mladic wanted UN personnel to be filmed at the radar site. The UN personnel were held by force or by the threat of force. Most were kept incommunicado from their superior command. Some were beaten, physically mistreated, or threatened. On the 26th of May, Mr. Miladic spoke with General Nikolai and General Rupert Smith. On slide 107, you can see an excerpt from this conversation. In this particular portion of the conversation, Mladic acknowledges that unperformed personnel have been placed at installations that were targeted in NATO airstrikes. Quote, I have been informed that you are holding in detention eight of my unarmed UN observers, and also that three of them are tied to an ammunition fence in Pale, and also that by your order, these men will be killed in case there will be new airstrikes. Mladic. I have been informed that some unperformed representatives have been located at objects which were targeted by General Smith yesterday and today. In this next slide, we can see more of the conversation. In this particular excerpt, it is put directly to Mladic. Quote, have threats been expressed that these people will be killed? Did you, General Mladic, threaten them like that? Unquote. Mladic responded, General Smith has no right to question me. I am expecting new airstrikes. I hope that you have been informed that my answer will be the death rattle. Unquote. Smith and Nikolai were confused. Quote, I don't know what you are talking about. End quote. Mladic then said, quote, Let him bombard and he will know. On the 26th of May, Mladic made direct threats to Smith that he would harm eight UN military observers taken hostage. On the 28th of May, Mladic confirmed to Smith that some of the captured UN personnel were being held at his own headquarters, as well as other locations the VRS believed were potential targets of NATO planes. Slide 109 shows this particular passage, indicating that Mladic held hostages at his own headquarters in an effort to keep it from being targeted. Quote, General Smith, you are responsible for what has happened. You started killing 
by NATO aviation. We are treating unperformed soldiers correctly and humanely. It's true we have placed them at certain locations, starting from my HQ and so on, which we assessed that you would decide to cover in a carpet of NATO bombs. But except for a few cases, we have treated them correctly, unquote. The hostages were held until the first, until the first were released on the 2nd of June, 1995, a process that continued until the 19th of June. Earlier today, I spoke about the situation in the eastern enclaves, the UN safe areas. I told you about General Morion's plea to Miladic to resist the urge to ethnically cleanse them. I told you about Miladic's threat to David Harland to kill everyone but the children in these eastern enclaves. The next segment of the opening statement, Your Honor, concerns Srebrenica and will be given by Mr. Peter McCluskey. We are ahead of the time. We are taking less time than we thought to make our opening statement, and if it's convenient to the court, we would be able to complete, adjourn here for the day and complete the remainder of the opening statement tomorrow, or should the chamber wish, after a short break, we can rearrange the podium and continue forward today. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Groom. Um, we were informed that Mr. McCloskey would need approximately two hours. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And then for an unspecified uh, time, you would deal with some legal matters? I think approximately about uh, 30 to 45 minutes, Your Honor. Which means that uh, in approximately in the first two sessions tomorrow, you would be able to conclude? Possibly, Your Honor. Yes, because then if anything would come up which would require further time, uh, practical matters, administrative matters, we would still have time for that. I believe that's the case, Your Honor. Yes, under those circumstances, your request that Mr. McCloskey starts tomorrow is hereby granted. Before we adjourn, um, one small observation, Mr. Groom. You now and then quoted from material which was then played after that. Uh, your quotes, even when you said you quote literally, were not always exactly the same. There was one which I'd like to put on the record. At um, page 56, line 22, uh, you were quoting uh, from a what was reported as a conversation uh, in a vehicle um, Mr. Mladic would have had with Mr. Lesic. Um, the line was, and whenever I come by Sarajevo, I killed, that is how you quoted it, whereas on page 57, line 13, it's not the past, but it's in the present. It, there it reads, and whenever I come by Sarajevo, I kill. I'd like to have to put that on the record. It might be a mistake or a slip of the tongue. Your Honor, it, it, it was just a misstatement. It, 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 I did intend to say kill, not the past tense. Yes, and it was recorded as killed. Uh, then, um, I'm looking at my colleagues. If there's nothing else at this moment, we can adjourn. We will adjourn um, for the day and we'll resume tomorrow, Thursday, the 17th of May, at 9 o'clock in the morning in this same courtroom. All rise. Fear for